Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about some of the practical aspects of value control in a company. I know the conventional practice is to add a control premium. Often when you see acquisitions, you see companies value, in this case target companies, and a premium of 20, 25 or 30% added on for the value of control. That seems a little sloppy and lazy, don't you think? Let's think about what the value of control is. The value of control derives from the fact that you think you can run a company better than the status quo and the existing management. And to value control, you really have to value the company twice. Once with the existing management in place and once with you in place. And the difference is the value of control. Of course, in order to be able to do this, you have to take control of the company. So you have to multiply this value of control by the likelihood, the probability that you can change the existing management of the company. So let's put this into practice. If I gave you a company and I ask you to value control, you have to look at potential ways in which you can increase the value of a company. You're saying that's going to be incredibly complicated. Not really. There are only four places you can go generically to raise the value of a company. You can go visit the existing cash flows and see if there are things you can do to increase your existing cash flows. Perhaps you can cut costs and improve margins. Perhaps you can lower the tax rate you pay on, the, on, the, on your earnings, which increases cash flows. Maybe you have too much in working capital. So your first stop is to look at your company and say, is there a potential for me to increase my cash flows and existing assets? And some of the numbers you might look at are the operating margins of the company relative to its own history and the sector. So if you have a company that's earning 7% margins in a sector where everybody else is making 15, maybe there's a chance for you to cut costs and improve margins. But if it's earning a 17% margin in a sector where everybody else makes 15, maybe there isn't that much of a chance. Second stop is you look at the value of growth. You could go for increased value from growth. You're saying that's easy. Let's just push for more growth. Not necessarily. Sometimes you can increase the value of growth by growing less. You're saying, how can that be? Well, it depends on whether you're earning more than your cost of capital or less than your cost of capital. If you're a company that's growing and investing and earning less than your cost of capital investing, you will actually increase value by reducing your reinvestment rate and taking fewer projects that earn less than your cost of capital because that will increase value. But if you're earning more than your cost of capital, it is true, increasing your reinvestment rate, finding more projects that earn more than your cost of capital will increase value. So when you talk about the value of growth, you're first going to stop and make sure you're earning more than your cost of capital. And if you are, you're going to say, can I increase my reinvestment rate or my return on capital? And perhaps you can increase value that way. Or if you're earning less than your cost of capital, you're going to ask, can I cut back on my reinvestment and increase value that way? Your third stop is to look at what kind of competitive advantages you have. Now, this looks in the background in evaluation. You never explicitly talk about competitive advantages, but when you assume your company earns more than the cost of capital, you're implicitly making that assumption. So the question you have to ask is, what are the company's competitive advantages? Are they strong and sustainable? Can I make them stronger and more sustainable? And finally, you're going to look at your cost of capital. Perhaps you can lower your cost of capital. Now, the obvious way you're taught in corporate finance to do this is change the mix of debt and equity. And you could look at your actual debt ratio versus the optimal. But there are three other things you might consider. The first is if you mismatch their debt to your assets, you have short term debt funding, long term assets, dollar debt funding, euro assets, get rid of that mismatch. It increases default risk, raises your cost of debt and capital. Also, if you can make your products and services less discretionary, you're effectively lowering the cost of capital, as is lowering the fixed cost you have as a company. So you can go for increased cash flows, try to get more value from growth by either cutting back on growth if you're earning less than the cost of capital or increasing your reinvestment if you're earning more. Third is you can try to improve your competitive advantages. And by doing so, you increase the length of your growth period and your excess returns. And finally, you can try to lower your cost of capital. So let's take two companies to illustrate this process. One was Gerdau Steel, a Brazilian multinational steel company. Brazilian in the sense it started off as a Brazilian company, is now a multinational steel company. And this is a valuation I did in 2007. I won't go through the details of this valuation, but take a look at the valuation. and You will see the value that I've estimated per share is about $16.24. And to make this estimate, I've started with the existing cash flows. I've assumed they would grow about 10% a year based on how much they reinvest, a 60% reinvestment rate and a 16.8% return on capital. At the end of five years, I essentially put them into stable growth and I allow them to earn their cost of capital. So five years of excess returns, growth during that period, and then stable growth with no excess returns. 
To discount the cash flows, I used a weighted average cost of capital reflecting their existing mix of 76% equity, 24% debt. Now, I've incorporated country risk through my cost of, uh, cost of equity and my cost of debt. My co cost of equity is affected by my country risk being put, my country risk premium and my cost of debt through my country default spread. So my cost of capital reflects country risk. It reflects the cash flows and growth rate I have. The value that I get for the company based, with the, based on those assumptions is $16.24 with the status quo. You're saying, why the status quo? Because I've taken what the company is doing right now and assume they will continue to do it, both in terms of the existing debt ratio mix, as well as how they're reinvesting and how well they're reinvesting. We'll come back and visit, revisit Gadao in a few minutes. But the second company I'm going to focus on is a company called Genting Burhad. Genting Burhad is a Malaysian company. It's a company that is in, in multiple business. And you see my valuation as of July of 2016, again with the status quo. And in the status quo, I assumed revenue growth, which was fairly, fairly low, 5% a year. And this is in Malaysian ringgit. And margins reverting back to about 20% over time. Their historic margins have been closer to 27%. But in my status quo valuation, given that they're focusing on revenue growth, I'm going to assume your margins are not going to improve that much. Their sales to capital ratio, which drives the reinvestment, is assumed to be 0 0.80. And that's going to drive my reinvestment. Again, at the end of 10 years, I make them a stable growth company that earns its cost of capital. I discount the cash flows back at a cost of capital that reflects a mix of about 66% equity, 34% debt, country risk is incorporated. And the value that you see that I estimate for the company in, 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 in ringgit terms is captured as it's, it's a little less than $10 based on the existing company, the existing management run, running the company. Now, the question then is, is there something we can change in these companies to push up the value and that's going to tell us what the value control is. To make that judgment, I'm going to take a look at each company. And this is this is the way in which I would look at any company. I look at it, look at the company saying, where is my greatest potential for increased value? So I looked at Gadao Steel and say, maybe they can increase their cash flow. But then I took a look at their existing margin, which is 19 and a half percent. The tax rate they're paying, which is close to the Brazilian tax rate, and their non-cash working capital is 18.33% of revenues. And those numbers are all very close to the industry average. In fact, their margins are higher than the industry average. The working capital is slightly lower. I don't see much potential for increasing cash flows from existing assets. The reinvestment rate is about 60%. The return on capital is about 16.8%. That return on capital is well above the cost of capital. The growth rate I get reflects that reinvestment rate and return on capital. For the length of the growth period, I've used five years because this is a big steel company in a mature business and the cost of capital is based on a 24% debt ratio. The most obvious place to start is with the debt ratio. I wanted to see whether that 24% debt ratio could be increased to lower the cost of capital. And to answer that question, I looked at the optimal debt ratio for Gada. What I effectively did was change the debt ratio from 0 to 90%, adjust the cost of equity and cost of debt consistently, because both will go up as my debt ratio goes up and kept track of my cost of capital. And based on my assessment, it looks like Gadao's cost of capital will be minimized at a 50% debt ratio. So I've got at least one thing that I can change in the company. Maybe I can use more debt. So that's the first change I made is I raised the debt ratio to 50% reflecting my optimal, which lowered my cost of capital. The rest, the changes were either non-existent or very minor. I left the existing cash flows unchanged because as I said, the margins are already sky high. They're, they're, they're doing a pretty good job running the company. I did push up the reinvestment rate very mildly. Basically, I was, I, was, I was realistic in my assessment. I said, what if they could, I mean, they're earning well above the cost of capital. What if they took a few more projects and accepted a slightly lower return on capital on those projects? Well, that combination of more projects with slightly lower returns on capital, lower return on capital, but still higher than the cost of capital gives me a higher growth rate for the company. Everything else stays as is. The value that I get for the company with those changes put in is about 17.91. You think that's not much of a change? You're right. It's not much of a change. It's about a 10% increase in value. But are you surprised? Because if it's a well-run company, that's exactly what you'd expect to see. The value of control is going to be relatively small because the company is run fairly close to optimally. So if you ask me what the value of control in Gardao is, it'd be about 10%. Let's take a look at Genting Burra. As I look at Genting Burra, there are four places I can go to increase value. First is maybe I can push for more revenue growth. 
5%, maybe I can try to make it 10, 15 or 20%, but here's the problem. The businesses that Genting is in are pretty mature businesses. It's going to be really difficult to increase revenue growth without cutting prices. The second stop is maybe, maybe I can push my margins back up to what they used to be prior to the most recent time period. They were about 27.9%. Some of this I'm at the mercy of commodity prices, but to the extent that I can push the margin up, that might be what I want to focus on, not the revenue growth, because that 27.9% is clearly feasible. They've done it before, and if I can push it up there, that's going to push up my operating income and my value. I could try to change the mix of debt and equity, but as I took a look at the optimal debt ratio, it turns out that their actual debt ratio of 34% is very close to the optimal. So unlike Gadao, where there is a potential for increasing value by changing my debt ratio, with Genting, there isn't that potential. There is a, a fourth way in which you could increase value, which I didn't quite explore because I don't know enough about the underlying value. Kentik Barad sits on a lot of real estate. Its plantations could potentially have much more value as real estate. It is possible that selling some of these assets to a better use could increase the value. Since I don't know enough about the potential for this, I'm going to leave it alone. So here's what I did at Genting. I kept everything else the same. The debt ratio stays the same. The cost of capital doesn't change. The only variable I allowed to change, the only two variables I focused on was perhaps they could improve their margins to 27.9% over time. And perhaps they can be a little more efficient about how they reinvest. And the way this shows up is as a higher sales to capital ratio. So higher target margin and less reinvestment in the form of a of a, of a higher sales to capital ratio. I'm being a little unfair to the status quo management here because I'm taking these, these, these assumptions from the outside. Maybe they're not feasible, but to the extent that they're feasible, I dramatically increased the value of the company from, from the $9 and, uh, and cents that you saw before to almost $16. The value of control here could be immense if, in fact, the margin increase is feasible and the company could reinvest a little more efficiently. So if you take a look at Gurdaw Steel and Genting Barad, you have the framework for value control. You basically have to value the company twice. The status quo value reflecting their existing policies on investing, financing, and dividends, and an optimal value based on what you think they can pull off. The difference in value the value of control. And already you can see that if you have a company that's optimally run already, the value control is going to be close to zero, as was the case with Gurdaw, where the value control was low. And to the extent that there is much more potential for improvement in either financing, investing, or dividend policy, you'll see a much bigger increase in the value of control. And of course, to do all of this, you have to change control. And the probability of changing control sometimes is not in your hands. It comes from the market you're in, the corporate governance make. So when we talk about corporate governance, this is effectively what we're talking about, right? The chance you have of changing the way companies run. To the extent that that probability of changing control is high, the expected value of control will be high. To the extent that that probability of changing control is low, the expected value of control is going to be low. So if you look at Gadao Steel, your chance of changing the way the companies run is close to zero because a company has set up a very elaborate cross-holding structure that will make it impossible for a hostile acquirer to come in and change the company. So unless management is a change of heart, you're not going to be able to change Gadao Steel. And if you attach a probability of control changing as zero, the expected value of control in Gadao Steel will become zero. In contrast with Genting Burhard, you're not going to be able to do a hostile acquisition, but there is a chance you could either change the way the company is managed, or if an acquirer comes along, it doesn't have to be a hostile acquirer that an acquisition could happen. There is a finite probability, not a very high probability, but there is a significant probability of change. The expected value of control at Genting Burhard is going to be high, both because the value of control is high and there's a chance of control changing. You can already see why corporate governance is going to affect the expected value of control. The expected value of control in markets where change is possible, where corporate governance is strong, will be greater than the expected value of control in markets where that change is not likely. So when you talk about corporate governance, bring that into play. So in summary, the value of control is not 15, 20, or 25%. Some rule of thumb, it has to be estimated by taking your company, valuing it first with the status quo, then taking a look at the insides of the company and making reasonable judgments on what the company can change to be run better and valuing the company with those changes put in. The difference will be the value of control. And as a final step, 
attach a probability to control changing, you got an expected value of control. So if you look at the value of control at companies, those are the drivers of the value of control. And it is an interesting way of in which you can think about how much you should pay at a premium on an acquisition or what the value of a voting share should be relative to non-voting shares because those are all driven by the expected value of control. Thank you very much for listening.